Hello, this is Professor Zafari. In this lesson, we're going to discuss modern Middle Eastern art. To begin, let's look at the transition from traditional Middle Eastern art to art that's influenced by Europeans. We can see this most readily in the example of architecture from the Ottomans. This is the entrance to the Topakapi Palace. This palace in Istanbul was built by Suleiman the Magnificent and most of the Ottoman sultans lived in it. So the entrance here has a traditional calligraphy uh, phrase from the Quran, has the arched doorway and two towers flanking it and when you enter you get the courtyard and then if you enter the royal chambers this is the throne room. What I want to point out to you is the synthesis of multiple Middle Eastern artistic elements. We see the calligraphy painted on the tile, we see the arabesques painted on the archway, we see the elaborate designs repeated over and over, very traditional Middle Eastern artistic design. Here's another image of the Topakapi Palace at night. You see the domes, you see the skinny tall minarets that are a trademark of the Ottomans. This next image is an interior room of the Topakapi Palace. And again you see the floral designs, the vegetal designs that are repeated here in the tile work. You see the calligraphy, you see the theme of repetition, all traditional elements of Middle Eastern art. So to contrast this, let's look at the Domabachi Palace. The Domabachi Palace was built in 1853, so of course in the late years of the Ottoman Empire, and it was built in an entirely European style. It's a neo-baroque style, very ornate, 285 rooms all decorated lavishly with crystal and china and art from all over Europe. This is the grand staircase with one of the largest crystal chandeliers in the world. So you can see immediately this is not a traditional Middle Eastern aesthetic, very European in its style. When you see the interior rooms, it's very clear that the Ottomans were moving away from traditional Middle Eastern styles and were being very much influenced by the Europeans going to the extent of building their palace in an entirely European manner. Here's another image of the interior. So this trend of European influence really pervaded all aspects of Middle Eastern culture and society and of course that includes art. So what we see is that Western style military, scientific and technological reforms in the Middle East also lead to the introduction of Western style painting. And if you remember up until now, Middle Eastern artists have really held to their traditional styles. Even though Europe during the Renaissance sees painters developing perspective, and they're trying to capture more realism in their art, Middle Eastern painters stay true to their traditional styles. Although they're aware of the developments in Europe, they maintain steadfast in their own traditional styles. But by the 1800s, and especially the late 1800s, this is not the case. We see many Middle Eastern artists adopting Western styles of painting, even going so far as to traveling to France and other countries to learn from European master painters. Here's one example from 1908 with a Turkish painter portraying a scene in a Turkish market. This landscape then is very much an imitation of a European style painting. So when we get to the modern era, roughly the mid to late 1900s, we see more individualism in art. Artists are not as intent on imitating European painters, but instead they're developing their own individualistic styles. There's multiple references. Artists are not taking their inspiration from simply one source. They're referencing their ethnic 
group. They're referencing their religious culture. They're referencing history sometimes. So there's multiple references in their work and the art shifts. There's art that shifts between abstraction and realism and art that shifts between traditional and modern genres. So artists are refusing to be captured in one category shifting between different genres and shifting between different references. So let's take a look at some examples. Here's one example of a purely abstract painting from a Middle Eastern artist. I'm not going to give you the name of every artist whose works we're going to look at. It'll be an overwhelming list for you. Instead, let's focus on the artistic properties purely abstract, celebration of color, there's still movement, but a thoroughly modern artistic genre. In contrast, this one shifts between abstraction and the traditional art of calligraphy. Because if you notice here on the right side of the canvas, you see Arabic letters that are swirling they're nonsensical, they're not forming any full words or even phrases, but they're blending rather into an abstract canvas. So this is what I mean between shifting, so this is what I mean with the phrase shifting between genres, going from the traditional genre of calligraphy and blending it with the genre of modern abstraction. Here's another example. This is a poem by Mahmoud Darwish, a modern poet. And so the artist here has taken calligraphy, a very traditional form, but has evoked it in a very modern style with his more loose brush strokes and the ink splotches for the dots over the letters. And the poem roughly translate to, eat my wheat and drink my wine. My sky is on your shoulders, my earth is yours. Keeping true to the respect and love for poetry, keeping true to the traditional art of calligraphy, the artist has combined them in a very modern way here. Here's another example of a modern work of calligraphy. And it's very simply here, two letters, and they form the word haq, which means truth. So big sweeping bold brush strokes in a very modern manner, very simple in its minimalist style, yet evoking the traditional art of calligraphy. Here's another example. So the traditional art of calligraphy is clearly not lost it is simply being reinterpreted in a different way. But we also have completely new forms of art. Here, for example, in this work called Grafting, we have a collaborative work between a Palestinian artist and an Israeli artist, and they have grafted branches from different olive trees from Palestinian territories and from Israeli lands, and they've grafted the tree together and it's grown like this. So it's an environmental work, and it's a collaborative work, a really unique genre, and making a pretty profound political statement. We also see really innovative work in architecture. One of the most world-renowned architects today is an Iraqi-born architect named Zaha Hadid. She was born in Iraq, but during her childhood, she and her family moved to London. So she has lived in London most of her life, and that's where she built her career. And her architecture is known for these organic shapes and curvaceous, swooping lines. She's designed many famous buildings, including this one. This is the Aquatic Center uh, that she designed for the Olympic Games when they were held in London. And what Hadid remarks is that much of her architecture was influenced by the marshlands that she saw in Iraq. There's a section of Iraq's geography that is marshland like this. And during the flooding season, 
the different huts and different homes look like floating islands. When the rivers are not flooded as they are now, you have a much more, you see much more land between the homes. So this blending of land and sea, of earth and water, she says influences much of her work. And I think you can see it here in this model of one of her designs. Where the building ends and where the water begins are all melded together, similar in the marshlands that inspired her.